Thanks very much, Maggie. Um, so just to manage your expectations right from the start, and uh, Mario and I are talking about impact and modeling, um, I am a complete and utter layman when it comes to modeling. But maybe what I can do is give the, the benefit of a grantee, so somebody who, who's, who's trying to, to work on the ground and affect positive change, uh, and where we see modeling fall, fall, fall into that. But also with Maggie's warning ringing in our ears, what is impact, and we'll probably have 40 different definitions. When we're talking about modeling here, we're talking about a very specific part of impact. And I think Maggie's term, in, ter in her, her terminology, it was a specific level of impact. And here we're talking about productivity. Uh, livestock productivity. So we're thinking of, we start off on a baseline with productivity of X, uh, intervention comes in, and then we get productivity Y. And you always, you hope that Y is greater than X, but that, that's not always the case. Things, things don't work, work out. So just a, an example, you're starting off with four liters uh, per cow per day, that's X, then you go through to Y, and that's uh, potentially six liters a day. Um, so then if, you, if you've got a, a, you know, a significant difference there, that does then flow into to livelihood uh, outcomes. Um, but here, just to, to frame what we're talking about in terms of impact, we're talking about that productivity. So, so, so just, just at that level and not getting out to, to, to the livelihoods. Um, but from a grantee's perspective, if you think about impact and, and X baseline and Y end line, you invariably think about going out into the field and collecting data, uh, baselines and end lines. Um, and with that, there are considerable challenges. Um, and I'll just very quickly run through them because it helps uh, uh, sort of where, get our thinking as to where we came from from, from this modeling perspective. Um, there are many challenges. I'll just outline three in two in, in for the sake of time. So firstly, uh, scale. So we aspire to, to scale with, with, with our grants. Um, that's how we're going to achieve um, an impact at scale. Uh, and for, for a specific initiative, now this could, and it does for, for us, literally mean working in 14 different countries for one initiative, five million smallholder customers. How on earth do you go and gather data that adequately covers that? It's a big logistical challenge, it's a big budgetary challenge. Second, the complexity, with GovMed working on the animal health side, we're covering multiple production systems, multiple livestock species, all of which have multiple diseases. Then our intervention is bringing in multiple animal health products, often up to 20 animal health products. So you've got a lot of complexity there. But then you've got the status quo. And we, we always often underestimate how much there is already out there in terms of animal health provision. So what about all those products which are already flowing in? How does that figure into our X and, 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 and Y factoring? Then on top of that, you've got you know, the, the, the non-health things. You've got just things like rainfall. That is hugely going to impact what X and what Y is, and how do we account for that? Uh, thirdly, sustainability. Uh, a lot of grantees, we're, we're working with private sector partners because we want the impact to, to be lasting, and, and, and that's how we see it running through. Um, private sector partners are brilliant at collecting some specific areas of data, uh, absolutely rubbish in other areas. So that's another challenge and difficulty that we, we, we have. So if you look in its entirety at all of these, these challenges that you have in terms of going onto the ground and collecting new data, it's probably just intuitive that as a grantee, you look at modeling and what can we get from that. And so when we're talking about modeling, and it is early days with where we are, but I'll just sort of outline our thinking on it. Um, and possibly in terms of data, you've got, you've got three levels of data. Firstly, you've got your productivity data. Uh, a lot of which is already out there, which is a wonderful thing if you're looking at going and getting data and using a lot of money, you can, can you use what's already there? A lot of it's imperfect, but quite a bit of it is actually good. What, what, what use can you make of it? Secondly, disease information, whoops, sorry, disease data, same thing. What diseases are out there? What is their prevalence? What is their incidence? Uh, a lot of the data is lacking, but there is other data out there. What can we use from that? And then third level or, or, or stream of, of data coming in relates to the actual intervention. And that is your sales data, so your, your, uh, your products which are flowing in as a result of your initiative, your, your doses of vaccines or therapeutics coming in, and they are specifically addressing 
the red, which there shows the overlap of disease and productivity. That's basically why GalvMed is there. The, the, the red denotes you, you eating into to the, to the productivity. So from a modeling point of view, what you're aiming to do, and because we live in, in an ideal world, I'll show it that, that the red completely disappears. Modeling is really defining the blue. How big is the blue? And if you're doing that on paper, potentially using data which is already there, it's another strand of, act of, of impact assessment which is then available to, to, to the grantees. So that's basically how we came to the thinking that this potentially offers something new for us. It's not going to take away the, the going out and the gathering data, but in terms of our overall understanding, um, this potentially helps in, in, in a number of different ways. So if you just think about a grantee going out collecting data, it's generally GalvMed or another grantee with one or two partners. Using a modeling approach, we're now bringing in CSIRO, we're bringing in Illory, we're bringing in University of Glasgow, you're widening it up and you're bringing other people in to, to help improve the understanding. Um, secondly, just from a sheer cost point of view, going out and collecting data, hugely expensive. If you've already got good data there and you're selecting the good data, you can potentially have a much more efficient way of coming up with assessments of impact. Um, so I'll hand over to, to Mario now, but that hopefully just sets the scene from, from a grantee's perspective of why we're looking at, at impact modeling. Yes, thanks. Thanks, everyone. So basically, Basically, yes, this is a very good example of how uh, the community can actually engage with specific projects, some funded by Gates, some funded by other donors, to try to uh, articulate better the kinds of impacts that, uh, that the projects are actually having. In this case, we're using the, the government uh, project and its interest. And, and there's several people involved in this in this activity. If if they could stand up, please, so that the, the audience knows them. Roy, Carl, Kanai, Andrew, Dola, Mike. Uh, this is this is all the part of the live gaps and the and, and the modeling bit. You can talk to any of them because they will have um, a information. So Look, we have we are now in the position where we can actually uh, assess the impacts either of, of diseases or diff different productivity interventions like uh, improved feeds or uh, an, an improved market intervention because we have we have built consistently through the live gaps and the SEVI projects a, a series of a, a modeling structure to actually a uh, assess the impacts of these different interventions. This usually starts from the, the collection of household level information, uh, trying to parameterize a, our productivity models with uh, information from the real world, trying to collect real baselines. Then look here, in, in the community has a lot of productivity models that we are uh, putting to use very effectively to estimate the what ifs of an intervention on meal production, on egg production, and so on. And these are the kinds of things that we're using in, in the case of Kaufman. Um, the reason, uh, and then th there's, a, there's a third element that we haven't explored here too much. Hannah put a, up a slide on uh, what would be the consequences of upscaling of upscaling this technology. Many, very often, uh, donors want the country level impact uh, well articulated. And for this, at least in live gaps originally, we also use the impact model to look at what this would mean to, uh, to the production of, of milk and eggs in a particular country. And this is something that I think that, that we are very well equipped to do. But it's something that it's, it's, it's an aspect probably missing in the way that we, that we can actually get it in, 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 the, full, uh, in the full framework. Because we can actually re really do this effectively uh, with the information and the tools that we have. Now, 
what from a modeling perspective what what modelers would really love is look a well-defined impact pathway and this is something that in many cases some of the projects lack uh, because at the end of the day we want to actually provide results uh, and indicators to reflect the things that we want to change so if you don't really know that then we are in trouble and and it's it's something that probably uh, needs to needs to be done uh, a priori really carefully because um look in, in all of these exante assessments the we do monumental leaps of faith and monumental leaps of faith in the sense that well yes all of this is potential and and it could really happen but the reality is that there's a whole innovation system there's a whole institutional setup there that will actually prevent us to to do this so i would encourage everyone to to really think of this institutional setup carefully and not only think of the of the productivity indicators that that are probably the easiest ones but really start thinking of well how is this really going to fly in in the real world and this is something that we need that we need to really uh, try to engage much much better uh, maggie let me please. Great, thanks very much, Mario. And uh, impact pathways and the need to get them right is music to my ears. And actually, you know, I think Stan talked about the amount of investment there's been on the crop side. And having seen poor impact pathways from both the crops and the livestock side, if this community could come up with really good impact pathways from the livestock side, we could be so much more efficient. And we could show that a small amount of investment in livestock yields much greater results than all that past huge investment in the crop side so we could really take the livestock sector forward. So there's a challenge. Okay, so our final presentation in this part of the session is from Louise, who's going to talk about consolidation of outputs and what all these benefits of the community can do. Over to Louise. Thanks, Maggie. So I'm going, I'm going to introduce today some of the work that's just started at SEBI, working on the livestock portfolio indicators. So this triangle represents where SEBI fits in in this whole picture around M&E and impact. So at an individual level, there's grantees collecting data and doing M&E, and SEBI's role is to the next step up to start looking across those grants and how that information can be consolidated at a livestock portfolio level. This then will feed up into those higher level strategic goals. So the actual livestock portfolio, this is some of the work that we've been doing as LD4D is to map our projects funded by the foundation. There's over 100 livestock projects and they've been designed, divided into three sort of sectors, animal health, adoption and animal systems. And they're a mixture of R&D and farmer facing projects. So the very first phase, as we've just started, is to be working with five grantees, farmer facing grants, two animal health, Galvmed and um, Sidai, who are both here, and likewise animal production, ACGG and ADGG, chicken genetic gains and dairy genetic gains projects, and Land Lakes, who are all represented here today. And there's a sort of a wide geographical coverage, the orange being the, light, the animal health and the green, the animal production. The second phase, which we haven't started yet, will actually spread out to some other animal production grants, but it's here for sort of just to say that this is work in progress. Um, the workflow that we're envisaging, it's very much work in progress, we're finding our feet, is actually have discussions with grantees, understand what data has been collected, what currently calculations they're using, what M&E they're doing, and actually really understand a lot of the caveats. This will be quite variable across the different grants, and understanding that variability and then trying to understand how they can be consolidated at a livestock level and really understanding those differences amongst data and what's possible and what isn't. And then finally, actually trying to produce some dashboards, but actually trying to communicate that this is very much work in progress, there's lots of caveats, and it's not just the number, but the context behind those numbers. So for animal health, again, this is work in progress. It's been identified um, initially six indicators for portfolio. So the two in blue mortality rates and performance of veterinary services are from external data, probably. And the other four will be based on data collected by grantees 
um, with calculations. And so in the gray box at the top, we've got that sort of soup of different data indicators, not all grants might be collecting that information, but it's really trying to understand what the grantees are doing, and then also working out what other data could feed in. For animal production, it's been divided between chickens and dairy. And so for the dairy, we've got milk yield per cow, household income, and net economic benefits per household. Um, and again, it's sort of working out what data has been collected and then what other data might need to feed in. For poultry, it's similar, egg production, improved income, up adoption rates. And again, there's quite a variety of information that could be collected by grantees. And it's trying to map that all out. Um, so unfortunately, Gareth's not here today. So I'm going to be presenting the next three slides that he developed. And what we've been talking about is that it's not just the numbers, it's the context behind those numbers. And so we were trying to work out if we could actually communicate that number, but what it what lie behind it, how much data went into it, what type of calculations. And we've been thinking about having some sort of tiered system, whether it's a gold to bronze, good data, good calculations, complexity, or limited data, but there is a number. Um, and so we've been thinking about how you would actually calculate livestock saved. And again, it's trying to communicate all those assumptions behind that number. So for example, you've got your vaccine sold, but we know that there's wastage. Not, if you have a pack size of 500 vaccines, not all of those vaccines go into animals. We've even heard that you could actually have a five mil dose that could be spread between two animals. So there is a lot of assumptions behind these calculations. And we really wanted to try and get those communicated. Likewise, with net economic benefit, it could be a very simple calculation, very basic data, or it could be a lot more complex with a lot more information feeding into it. So I think it's really trying to communicate that we're going to try and also, as well as the number, have some sort of context behind those numbers. And then, so again, this sort of slide is trying to communicate that, that we'll try and think about different tiers for those calculations. And we're going to try and be creating visual cues. I've been looking into sort of visualization best practice. And there's lots of different ways, but I think we're going to initially start with colours to try and indicate data sources and perhaps shading around those numbers. And we also want to sort of empower the people that are using those dashboards that there is a number, but there's caveats behind those numbers. This is sort of an initial sort of draft of a dashboard that we might think about creating. The green, so that sort of colour indicates the different data source. So in this case, the green is that those mortality rates have come from literature. As we know, some of the work we've been doing on SEBI around calculating mortality rates is really not a trivial thing to do. And then the blue here is saying that that's based on a calculation. The lighter colour is the tier one type calculation. So you, you do actually have to interpret those numbers with care. Um, and again, there may not actually be data. So for performance veterinary services for some countries, we might not even have a number. So in a way, that's a finding in itself, a data gap. And then as part of some of the work on doing the data portal, we sent out a survey to find out what types of data people are collecting. But one of the questions we asked in that survey was, and this is based on <clears throat> 20 grants, where they saw, this is a perception of how those grantees saw their grants feeding into those higher level strategic goals. And what's interesting is that obviously you've got agricultural productivity, nine grantees recording that, but you do have all four strategic goals represented in a portfolio of 20 grants. So I'd just like to finish on how LD4D can help feed into this. Across the three days, we've got different sessions. So on day two, we have a session on data quality, and we're hoping to hear from grantees and their stories around how they've collected data and advice they can give to other grantees. We've got the session on LSMS livestock survey data. And this, again, is a very important data source for the community national representative numbers. We've also got story about data standards, this has come up a bit and whether how the community sees that playing out. And then finally, which I think is going to be really important for us, is how you communicate facts and how you use numbers. Great, thanks very much. And thanks to all the speakers for keeping to time because that's left us with minutes um, for Q&A. And I think what you've seen from that is if you got concerned by the, the presentations from the funders who are basically saying we need numbers, then hopefully the last few presentations have shown you you're not on your own in terms of delivering the numbers. And there's lots of help in this room which 
can actually, uh, as a community, help us to provide the best numbers and the numbers that those funders want. Uh, and so, uh, no pressure on everyone here, uh, but lots to make best use of the next couple of days to try and see how you can access that help uh, um, in the, the months to come uh, through um, efficient uh, emails and everything else to virtual meetings to um, get hold of that. And also, again, thanks for the opportunity for presenting something that's work in progress. And I think as researchers, it's a very important thing to learn to not wait until you've got complete confidence in what you're doing and then present it to your peers, but very much to share it on the way and to work as a community here to um, make sure that we get the best systems in place right from the start. So opportunity to feed into that. OK, so time for discussion. So first of all, if you can take any questions that people want to ask about clarification from any of the individual presenters, let's start with that and then move into comments or uh, more specific questions um, after that. So Alan has a roving mic um, to go around. And uh, so if people would like to put their hands up, and ask specific questions to start with. But if there are none of those, we'll move straight on to the other. But anyone with specific questions, clarifications, concerns? We have one. Great. Thanks for kicking us off. Uh, morning. I got the feeling from BFID that livestock is not their focus. Maybe just a clarification on why the lack of interest or focus on livestock. Um, you have pockets within BFID which is very interested in livestock, for example the research and evidence division where I work, but um, the livestock sector has been on, a, on its back foot for a number of years in BFID because livestock are seen in developed countries as being harmful to the climate, to people's health and to animal welfare. So it's been quite difficult within DFID to justify investment in livestock projects. And that has, it has recently changed, but it's primarily within the research section of DFID where you get some, some traction on funding livestock initiatives. In the rest of DFID, um, uh, you get very little um, activity in the livestock sector, much, much more in, 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 in other sectors. So you have to look at it within that. that. That's why I put up that bigger strategic objective. So for DFID, livestock doesn't really appear on the radar unless you can show how the livestock sector has an impact on those bigger strategic goals in terms of supporting the most vulnerable, in terms of um, maternal health, child nutrition, um, improving prosperity. If you can make that linkage with that impact pathway, then uh, livestock sector could get more traction within what is essentially a very competitive environment. People have to put the case, a business case, in order to get the funding within the FID. And that is very difficult when the data is not there. So I suppose the key point I was trying to make uh, to to you to L, LD40 is can you um, decide how most efficiently to gather the data in order to show the impact of the livestock sector? Thanks. So it's not just about the the understanding the context of the uptake. It's also understanding the context of um, the, the from the funders. Do you want to come in on the funders side? I think we just wait. I wanted and then to, there's two more questions. Fine. I wanted to chime in on what Tim said, and I think. From the foundation's perspective, we're really lucky that Bill Gates is an advocate for livestock, but that may not always be the case. And so um, a bit of the urgency behind our, our partnership with the SEBI team has been to try and establish some of the data foundations for the importance of the work in the communities and geographies with which we promote livestock. And so I think sort of where Tim is at DFID and, and sometimes maybe where Andrew feels like he is at USAID, it's not for certain that we won't end up there at the Gates Foundation. And so the work that you guys are doing is critical to help us establish the narrative to define the case that, that we're working with. Great. Thanks. Over to Jonathan and then Mario. Yeah, just uh, 
an observation when I visited Diffid um, about three months ago. I sat in reception and there's a whole train of photos about development. It's not a single animal in that. There's crops, there's people, but there's no animals. Um, so it's it's almost like a process of wiping out livestock to some extent in that context. And I think this partly originates with you know, very important work in terms of thinking about local and global environmental impacts of livestock. Um, but the public health implications of eating meat, um, I think, still needs to be scoped out. There was an article released in The Lancet, I think, yesterday, which talks very much about this. It's very much of the view of the negatives. It doesn't really talk a lot about the positives. Um, and I think we struggle to actually translate the good things we do into something that actually is tractable and, and acceptable to agendas that are currently circulating very strongly across uh, the developed world rather than the developing world. Thanks for that. And I'm sure this is something we're going to come back to. Over to Mario. Yeah, Maggie, I want to I want to raise a couple of they're probably philosophical questions for, for the group, but there should be enough brain power here to, to sort them. One is how do we know when a when we have a really good data. That's one crucial thing, because at the end of the day, this, this whole idea that we always need to improve and improve and improve the data collection before we can actually make a, a suitable decision. Well, look, it's, it's all very relative, and, and we don't have a, a, a true counterfactual in terms of a, a, for evaluating this. So I think that this is really important. The other one is, What's the accuracy of, of the data that we need uh, in terms of the decisions that we want to make? And for example, if I give you a mortality rate for Ethiopia of 15%, and I do it with the data that we have now, suppose that we do a monumental campaign and collect information for three years and we, found, we find out that it's 10%. Will your decision be different? Good point to make, and um, I think also the fact we yeah we need to show how things change, and we also need to show the progress. Andrew's next, and then Brian. Are you going directly on from that one, Brian? Are you going directly on from that point, or a separate one? John, take you over there. All right, I'll go. I'll go. So this is a comment, and I'm, and, and I. I apologise if I get a little evangelical here, because I've been on a bit of a journey the last few years, uh, and it relates to designing impact. Uh, right from the outset, and, and Maggie, your, your, your slide there at the start was fantastic in terms of the the, the impact pathways. Uh, but too often, and I've been involved in participatory research for 20 or so years now, and we've typically designed, thought about impact, being in participatory research, thought about impact uh, at the outset, but not really measured it until the end. And so I'm really advocating that we measure or design for measuring impact right at the very start and invest the appropriate resources. So the reason I say this, I'm coming to the end of a program in, in Indonesia through DFAT funded work, where a heavy emphasis on measuring impact on the ground of the, of the interventions. And not only did the overall program have a, a theory of, of change and an impact pathway, but every intervention had its own results chain impact pathway and indicators that had to be measured. An audited system where we had baselines and the counterfactual uh, so that over over four years, been able to very uh, very defensible numbers around uh, net income increases, livelihood improvements through women's economic empowerment. We've now got across the board of program uh, net income increases of over 100 100 percent in 300,000 households. Uh, the next phase is is a million target of a million households, and that wouldn't have happened if. That, and it's an audit, as I said, an audit system. If that hadn't been in place right from the outset, and every six months, every year, sending lots of enumerators into the field, and the point is, you've got to put a lot of resources into that. And I don't think too many programs at the moment actually allocate the resources for that sort of impact assessment. But if you're really going to get to the, get to the end game, you need to do it. Thanks, Andrew, and I totally agree with that. And it's actually it's uh, funders also being prepared to put their funding into um, measuring impact up front. So Brian and then um, Harriet. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, first of all, a comment on Mario's 
uh, or Mario's comment on, on, on quality. When is data good enough? Uh, I think it's a, a it, I think that's an artificial uh, concept, an artificial, I mean, is the question of what is the question being asked and how well do, does, do, do data allow you to answer a particular question at one stage? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's an ever continuing process. Data is going to continue to, to improve. Uh, it's a question of uh, how well uh, does the information that you've been provided with answer answer your question and move you on to the next stage? So, uh, so I, uh, I find it a very artificial thing, as if there's an endpoint of now we have reached quality data, because because I, I don't think that endpoint is achievable. Okay. That's a uh, question but, but I, for a discussion over uh, can, can, can I make the comment on the uh, yeah, the, 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 the different thing? I, I mean, I think the, S, the emphasis on SDGs is so important because SDGs does bring everybody around, that should bring everybody around the same table looking at broader global development impact. And I'm rather, I mean, I'm, I'm worried about DFID. I'm worried about whether it's the, the German uh, aid or the Dutch aid or whichever because they're all politically uh, linked to own uh, in interest from that particular country. And I applaud uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for uh, being able to tease out specific uh, uh, livestock issues. And while there are political issues there relating to, uh, they're, they're much more driven by, by, by change and by measurable uh, changes. So, so I, I, I applaud that. Okay, a benefit of having multiple funders. Harriet and then Andy. Okay. So thank you very much. I just want to follow up on um, on um, Mario's uh, question, and I think um, looking at it from a World Bank perspective and a data producer, which is the LSMS team, um, I think data. I mean, you can only there's no point in which you can say data is has reached its optimal level there's always room for improvement and one of the critical things especially for example in the livestock sector we've benefited from is getting feedback from from the national statistical offices on the one side getting feedback from multiple stakeholders is critical in order to improve improve the data and that does not prevent decisions from being taken also because it, it's it's a system that we the data we collect is uh, is, de is demand driven. So the NSOs tell us this is the kind of data we need in order to take decisions. And then data is collected, and then we get feedback from them saying, well, I don't think, for example, egg production, the way we are collecting data or the way we structure the questionnaire is giving us adequate, it's collecting the information correctly. So we improve on that and we collect better data. So it's a continuous process, but it doesn't prevent uh, uh, countries or individuals from taking decisions. But I think what's often missing in the livestock sector is, is feedback from different multiple stakeholders and a place in which this uh, can be coordinated. So you find that in some specific countries, there's a specific interest on only disease, but we don't get feedback from the other components on which we are collecting data. So I think LD4D could be one, one uh, important platform for that, for get, getting feedback on what uh, especially for the, from the academic point of view. A few years ago, we did, a, we did a conference in Tanzania on the usability of LSMS data. And I must say there were very few papers that were presented on livestock, giving, giving you know, the use. So I think there needs to be more uh, usability of the data in order to get feedback from other stakeholders. We get a lot of feedback from the NSOs, the National Statistical Offices, but I think LD4D could be a platform to get feedback also from a lot of other stakeholders in order to collect more targeted and better data. Thank Great, you. thanks for that. And again, the whole quality and how everybody's involved collectively in quality. Andy. Uh, discussion, so thank you for that. There are, and there are so many points out that have arisen that I'd like to address, but I'll try and confine myself to a couple of them. Uh, starting with Andrew's point about we really need to build in these questions of uh, M&E at, at the des design phase of a, a program. Um, I think we would probably all buy into that in, in some shape or other. The fact is with the, the work that uh, SEBI has at the moment, uh, we have, that, that hasn't been done. And so we're faced with a kind of retrofitting exercise, un unfortunately. And uh, we, we are faced with uh, a task of trying to do that for five of the current uh, 
Foundation grant, and we've committed to providing that data by uh, no later than February in the uh, in the new year. So this, this is basically a plea to those five grantees. We're working with you already, but please help us all you can to deliver that uh, because you've you've heard it from Louise, you've heard it from Shannon, you're now hearing it from me again. We need to to do that on the question of quality of data, fitness for purpose, and Mario's and uh, and Brian's points and. Yeah, th those are the kind of things that I think many of us are facing uh, every, in our everyday work. We, we certainly are in uh, in SEBI, and as I mentioned earlier during the Get to Know You session, we have a lot of arguments about this. Um, and Louise's model there, of her, her tiers of, spelled T-I-E-R, I think it is, um, one, two, and three is a kind of attempt to, to address that. But you're right, Brian, it is, you know, what's the, what's the original question? which should drive the decision about what the quality of data should be. And then there's this whole issue about, is it 10 or 15% mortality? Um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Thank you. Great. So it's all about community, community, community. How do we learn from each other and feedback to each other? Who's next? Yes. Um, hmm. Now, I mean, thank you for this interesting discussion. I mean, um, it's my first exposure to, to LD4D. But my observation is, in fact, you know, I don't know how the consortium could engage more from the end user side. You know, I refer to the government people, and I look forward very much to the to talk of Dr. Ching from Vietnam. But I think that I you know I like the concept that you you show from the beginning, Maki, how how to engage different the impact of different spheres from uh, from IDRC concepts. So I think that is also something interesting. And when I look at different projects you listed here, of course, you know, at the moment it's very much. African focus projects at the moment, and I would say that you know, I, I heard from the beginning from our colleague from the U.S. about the Fit the Future uh, Livestock Lab. So, so Cambodia is one of the country in this list, and we have a few small projects, I would say. But also, it's very much con uh, context specific at the moment. When we talk about livestock in Southeast Asia, many country uh, go into into the disease and food safety side and, and zoonotic disease control. And this is actually also the project in is leading in Cambodia on, on food safety. And then I think that you know some of this uh, data not directly linked to the production side, but it's more on the disease side need to be uh, uh, you know uh, pay attention more on some of the specific context. And, and and when I look at the donor landscape at the moment, I know that you know Gate Foundation is not focusing on Southeast Asia. But but just to make the point that the World Bank is still funding a few projects. Is still in food safety in livestock in, in Vietnam, but but it would be good also for you as DFEED and GATE and any other donor to also look at Southeast Asia as a region where you have a kind of different levels of development. You have Thailand is much bigger, uh, better than Vietnam, but you have next to Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar. You, I can tell you that some of these regions are not very much better to, uh, compared to Africa. So, so keep a little bit the equity things when you look at Africa, but also don't forget and don't neglect other country in, in, in the region where you are sitting. Great, thanks very much and for reminding us um, about the, the local context, the regional context, and not to make assumptions, frankly, um, would be what I would say. The world is a very heterogeneous place and different regions are different as well. Okay, another question, yes. Uh, more of a comment. I, th I think a lot of the problems that we're facing come from the level at which we're trying to, to share data. So, I mean, it's true that very few of the projects that LD4D is currently looking at have ever had M&E really built into them. That uh, They think of themselves just as monitoring their own progress with their own set of farmers. And, and that makes it very inherently difficult to share data because they're completely different in principles and what they're trying to achieve and who they're dealing with. And so Mario's question about is 10%, you know, how do we get from, how, what, what's, what's the, the correct answer to a piece of information? That, that's always impossible if I say to you, uh, my study shows 10% mortality or my study shows 15% mortality. If I say to you, these are the farmers I looked at and these are the deaths that occurred, then you can start to combine data and, and really improve data. If you just take, you know, PDFs and, and analyses, you can never properly combine them. But if you move down to a lower level and start to truly exchange data, then you start to extract power from, from overlapping studies. 
Great, thanks very much. That was a, a, a good comment. One final comment, a short comment, as I'm passing over at uh, 12 noon. Um, I just again wanted to make, make an observation, which I hope isn't seen as you know too trite, but listening to the discussion and understanding the complexity of what we're dealing with, it, it, it struck me that, that conceivably, we're talking at one side about what funders would like to know, and on the other side about what fundees are able to tell. And there's a, a gap between the two, despite the fact that everybody shares the same goals as, as to where we're trying to get to. And I suppose for, for um, LD4D, one of the places that they can operate in that space is to say, well, we aren't going to ever provide the perfect data. We aren't ever going to be able to uh, demonstrate every impact. But what we can do is to think about a framework that allows transparency. So that when a discussion arises about what is the impact that's arisen from one place or one project or another, it's not so much about a competition to say who's done the best or who's done the worst, but it's much more about an informed debate that says this is what we're able to tell you, aligning with what it is that you would like to know. And I think that, that opportunity to use data to, to, give, to give transparency and to express doubt is at least as important as trying to say what is the absolute answer to the, the question posed. Great. Thanks very much. And that's the... Jonathan, did you want to say something or no? You don't have to, no. <laughs> okay, so um, thanks no, very Maggie, I will, I will just say, I just want to say something about the mortality thing. We, we do not publish decent mortality data. Anybody who looks at mortality attributed to any disease will struggle to find anything on foot and mouth disease, on brucellosis, on various diseases, which means we can't do systematic reviews, we can't do meta-analysis. So we have to get smarter with our processes of how we estimate these things. And we have to keep reporting it in the literature so we can build a body of evidence. At the moment, that's absent. Great. And that's, a, that's a, another good point in that we all need to feel free in this sort of space to be able to say what hasn't worked, where the gaps are, and what we as a community can do to fill some of those gaps. But talking of gaps, that, that gap was, that was also highlighted about the, the gap between those who generate the data and those that use the data, and the big gap between that dialogue has to be the way that we bridge that gap. And again, it's, it is, it's exactly about transparency, it's about being honest, it's about add, owning up to this what we don't know and how we can improve it. And uh, as um, was put up right at the start by Karen, it's about accepting this is a space where there should be um, criticism. It's about people at it being feeling free and feeling safe to say what isn't working and um, how that can actually be improved without feeling criticized by anyone else in the room. So absolutely key. And so I'm about to hand over. So thanks very much to both the presenters and the discussants for making my job very easy. Great. Um, thanks, Maggie. That's got us off to a great start. And thanks to all the participants again. Um, we're going to move swiftly on. We're running a little bit behind schedule. So I'm going to ask Tim um, to come up and make a presentation. We're working Tim hard, but this is uh, a presentation on the, it's the livestock modeling workshop that happened in Rome earlier this year. So Tim. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, I'm uh, morning, everybody. I'm going to re report briefly on a on a workshop that we held in um, in Rome in May this year, which was uh, which was a follow up from the Naivasha meeting when we established a working group on data livestock data modelling, and following up from that, we wanted to pull together a group of people. To, to actually start this working group and get it going, and we we um, and we so we held this this livestock data modelling workshop in Rome. I unfortunately wasn't there myself at the time, but um, but I'm reporting back. Gavin, uh, sorry, Gareth Salmon, who uh, who's not able to be here. He he very kindly took some very extensive notes on the on the workshop, uh, and I've some, I've condensed the key issues of these into a couple of slides, which I'm I'm reporting back on now. So the objective of the workshop, and this is one of the this is one of the LD4D working groups, just to provide it in, in, in context. And there's a number of these different working groups 
And this is a, a newly established or one that's becoming established, let's say. So the idea is to bring together key technical people working on modeling of livestock distributions, production systems, uh, production amounts and foresight. So there's these various different levels that we sort of look at, at modeling in livestock sector. Uh, and of course, modeling is a very broad term. One could cover all sorts of things, but this is what we have sort of had in mind at this time. Uh, with a view to sharing and consolidating information and approaches to modeling livestock production as a feed into these um, to these partial equilibrium uh, foresight models. So models like impact and like the gaps model that uh, that FAO is using is uh, are the two main uh, foresight models that we had in mind here. Uh, there's a, a wide group of participants, uh, very key to that uh, with, with um, Carl and Mario who are here today as well. Uh, but this is a large, this is, oh, this slides aren't showing. It's, um, sorry, it's not in, it's, sorry, it's not in slideshow mode. Um, yeah. But, sorry, I didn't look behind me. I <laughs> nothing was happening. <laughs> is it being presented from that computer over there? It's got the first slide up. Try that. Sorry about this. Ah, all that presentation mode. Yeah, so those are the workshop, workshop objectives that I was I was telling you about. And that's the list of that's the list of people who who participated in the meeting. So it was a it was a fairly broad group. It was nice, and it's worth mentioning that everybody funded their own participation. There was no no sort of central resources or secretariat activity. I mean, FAO we provided the facilities and 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 coordinated the whole thing. But it's it's worth mentioning that you know there was enough interest in this that people 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 came of their own accord to the meeting. This the, the this was the sort of working objective behind the meeting. So we, the idea is that we have a shared experience, uh, public ref reflection, coming to some sort of collective meaning, and, and agreeing on some joint action. And I think I think it was quite a diverse group of people and a very broad set of topics. And I think we probably made it some way around this circle, but I don't think we we completed the whole process. So I think you know I think it's work in progress rather than a rather than a fait accompli. Uh, we certainly haven't come up to the joint action yet, but I think that's where we need to work forwards, towards. These are some of the key points. They're not in, not in any particular order, and they also are, are at very different levels. Some are very sort of high level issues, some, some rather more detailed and technical. It's important to um, realize that we want to standardize inputs and not models. I mean, there was never any ob objective of coming up with some standard standardized modeling approaches and um and i think that was a misconception at the meeting that led to a some, some misunderstandings uh but i think it's 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 important to be clear that we were trying to the objective of the meeting really from my perspective anyway was to try and work out where we could pool our resources to come up with common inputs to models but there was never any intention of standardizing models models have different objectives organized by uh, different groups to answer different questions. There's no question that we want to try and standardize models. What we want to do is to try and be more efficient in the in the inputs to these models where standardization can be effective and save time. And things like livestock numbers, production systems definitions, maybe feed commodity categories, definitely dry matter values and feed resources, feed rations, body weights, production, uh, reproductive parameters, various definitions. These are all things that can be usefully standardized and feed into the models that are doing very different things. Very specific thing is that we need a, a good dairy layer. We, we've struggled forever to have good production system data on dairy and distinguishing that from the dual purpose and the, and the sort of beef systems. That's, that's something that was recognized during the meeting. Uh, we need to link livestock populations better to livestock keepers. 
uh, need to review the ruminant production systems maps. We, as as um, Mario will know, and many others, we've been we've been using this production systems definition as a stratification, uh, ruminant production systems, and this really really is a limiting factor in, in many of our activities. And it links again to having the decent dairy layer. It's not it's not precise enough and it's not relevant enough. The 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 systems classification stratification that we're using. We really need to work work on that together and come up with something that's actually more practical, more functional. It's served, it's served many good purposes and it's been the best we can do so far, but I think it's worth a real concerted effort to come up with a better definition of, of production systems for ruminants in particular. Um, urgent need for better maps on grasslands and pastures, and I think that also feeds into the improved ruminant production system. We need to deal with non-marketable feeds, and this is an important issue in the in, in the partial equilibrium models. They're very good, I think, at accounting for traded feeds, but hopeless at accounting for non-tradable feeds, and that's something that needs to be needs to be properly addressed. So, so in fact, they're only accounting for a you know a certain percentage of feeds that are used, and that, that that's a real drawback to these models in terms of their output. We need to deal with livestock and product movements. That's again another thing that's not well dealt with. We need to deal with climate variability and climate change. Um, and then, then there are many, many issues with FAUSTAT data that we we all know about. But um, you know, we if we if we want a standard set of livestock data, FAUSTAT is somehow what we're tied into, uh, and we're aware of those constraints. I think it's being important to be to understand. What the constraints are, and you know, I know we're not going to find an alternative. So I think the best thing is to is to use the the stuff that is existing as best we can, and to be realistic about its its um, its capacities and its limitations. Um, and particularly the way that feed is dealt with in 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 Faustat data. I mean, there are all sorts of issues there, but many of them can be improved, and we need to try and set up a dialogue with Faustat and try and improve the system rather than. Uh, Rather than just avoiding it or poo pooing it. So that, those are the key the key points that came out during the meeting, as far as I could gather. And not being there, I'm afraid I'm sure there were many, many other things that that, that would have come up for different people, and and, and perhaps Carl and, and Mario will be able to to add to that. So next steps, we we've been developing a concept note, and um, and this this has sort of ground to a halt a little bit, but we need to bring that back to life. And I think we need to really embrace the, the you know, this this working group in that. So we need to think about how to take the working group forwards and, and have this concept note, embrace things that will hold that working group together and keep it moving and get it to come up with practical outputs. Um, there's a model inventory uh, being developed by, by Gareth, and that's going to be presented a bit later on today, I think. So that's something that came out of this working group. Uh, we, there was also talk of a production parameters data repository. I think it's a bit early to get into too many details about that, but that was something towards standardization of inputs that was thought about. Um, and there are many, many particular issues, as you, as you see, that need to be followed up on. But really, I think an important thing is to decide how to take this working group forward. And in taking it forward, I think it's important that it, it has a focus so it mustn't be too broad. It must really, really focus on some specific tasks. Otherwise, it'll just be a talking shop. And and it's you know it's it's fine to have a very broad discussion in the in the first instance to to, to get the working group together. But if we're going to take it forward, it needs to be focused. It needs to be properly resourced to to um, make sure that it continues. You know, and have have targeted outputs that are expected of it that it'll deliver on. So I think that's that's about it about the modeling working group. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, we have a session after. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. Yeah. Right. We have a session uh, after coffee this afternoon.